Alongside tales of conflicts between the British, Boers, the Basutu, Zulus, of dinosaurs, cannibals and farmers, you find an environment which tells the story of Earth's early history in a spectacular fashion, presenting itself in a way that makes it possible for every person to revel in this scenic natural wonder. This is the story of the area in and around the Golden Gate Highlands National Park in South Africa, which once was the center of Gondwana land. A long time ago, Earth didn't have seven continents. Instead, there was just Pangaea, the whole of Mother Earth. Due to drift, the supercontinent started breaking up around 200 million years ago, thereby creating two main land masses and oceans, Laurasia to the north and Gondwana to the south. Gondwana herself broke up and gave us South America, Antarctica, Australia and New Zealand, India, the Arabian Peninsula, Madagascar and Africa. Well, it goes right back to 1953 when my father was transferred from one of the mines in, on the reef to Valcombe, and he hadn't been there very long when he said to one of his colleagues, do you know of some place that I can go to and either climb a hill or a mountain? And a friend of his said, well, come with me. I know the place that you'll enjoy. In a country with numerous national parks, Golden Gate Highlands National Park lies in South Africa's Free State and is the only national park in this province. It was established in 1963 when three farms, North Brabant, Fuurland, and Witsis Ursprung were combined and declared a national park for the general purpose of protecting a pristine natural area. But more specifically, to conserve the impressive sandstone formations and an Afro-Alpine grassland biome. Bloemfontein, the Northern Cape province, and KwaZulu-Natal are all only hours away. Oatambo Airport is a mere three hours drive. From any of these locations, a journey can be made either as a self-drive or via coach or a number of smaller tour operators. It's just the right distance from the cities uh, to travel on the touring coaches, say from Pretoria, Johannesburg, to get to the Golden Gate National Park. And once you're in this area, there are lovely drives to go on and uh, sort of enjoy what the area has to offer. Hmm. The park's name was taken from one of the farms which formed the initial park area. In 1875, a farmer by the name of J.N.R. van Rienen and his family were traveling to their new farm, Führland, and stopped for a moment of rest. Here, they saw two massive rock buttresses forming a natural gate in the valley. He named it Golden Gate, for these two buttresses were aglow with a bright, deep golden color in the last rays of the setting sun. Waar die van Renens hulle plaas huis gehad het, 
na bij die kampplek, die huidige meriting van vandaag. En daar het ons heerlijke aandacht gehad met braaivlees bij die boerenmense op die plaats, braaivlees en pap. En in die ochtend het die tannie vir ons vars melk gebring van die huis af. The family cemetery is in plain view from the main route between Clarence and Harrismith, which runs through the park. Here we find the first reminder that this is the Highlands, an evidence of the quick changing and often extreme weather in this mountainous area. I think it was a scene of them with their verloofde. They had to stop, they had to go to Dransberg with the Ketangleer. And in that environment was the end very strong. It was very strong and strong. And he and his wife is there in the mountain, in the environment of the Heidegger Montexosus. As they were dead. And it was like what is in the family place today. And he was a bekende man in the environment, and he was also a bekende man in the environment, and he was also a bekende man in the environment, and he was also a man in the environment. Ja, allemaal weet die stories van hom en Willengeit is, sy, ek, as ek kind was ek by sy, as het was by sy ouma gewees, sy het nog daar geblei. En met die ou akkerboom om en die ou huisie wat nou vandag nou net die piekniekplek is daarvan. So ek het daarom sy ouma ontmoet en ja, vandag is Willengeit nog daar, is een baie mooi plek om te besoek. Anne Boland recalls her visits to the family which you'd go up and have tea with the von Rienens. And everything was just so beautifully laid out. And then tea was announced and served. And you'd go into the table at the table. And then would come their cook, all in white, with white gloves, to bring in the hot scones. <laughs> Since its inception, the park has been enlarged three times to conserve more of this magical prehistoric earthscape. They have expanded. I think they've started off with, say, purchasing three or four farms. And over the years, you often hear that another farm has been purchased in a large area, which is very attractive. The park has always been a special destination, not only to tourists, but locals as well. And I went uh, hiking up there. We had a sort of little band, um, and uh, the guys and I went up. I found it beautiful, and I was glad to come and live here. In addition to a number of park accommodation options, numerous guest farms are found in the Golden Valley, the area between the park and neighboring town Clarence. All sorts of activities ranging from mountain hikes, horse riding, Whitewater rafting, quad bike tours, and even game hunting safaris are on offer. And all this can be done in an area filled with prehistoric artifacts and evidence of Earth's earliest known times. The park was established for the protection and conservation of its pristine beauty, but also for people to enjoy and appreciate this unique African destination. The degree of public access within the park is determined by the sensitivity and value of the park's biophysical aspects, national heritage and scenic resources. Five distinct zones have been identified and each offers a different degree of access and utility. These zones range from remote through to high intensity leisure Early visits bring back vivid memories with fondness. We used to belong to the supper club and we used to go to the, what was it called? The Golden Gate Hotel, I think it was called. And for seven rand a person, seven rand, we would get um, a buffet meal with fish, prawns, anything, you name it, they had it. And then they had um, like also a whole um, bain marie thing, and they'd have chicken pie, uh, roast beef, a big haunch of beef like this, and they'd slice it off, and three or four different kinds of puddings for seven rand. 
It's at the Golden Gate Hotel where the more weary traveler can find solace in a resort-like setting under a breathtaking sandstone outcrop. Just a stone's throw away, you find the ever-popular mountain chalets for those who want the comforts and convenience of a hotel resort, but with a touch more independence. Jutting out from the surrounding alpine grasslands is the famous Brandwach Buttress and neighboring natural amphitheater, which holds steady and stands sentinel over the hotel complex and its residents. Glen Rhiannon Rest Camp is a hut and camping development just up the road from the hotel complex. Glen Rhiannon offers serviced family accommodation, including Africa's famous thatched rondavel units, and just across the road, a well-spaced camping terrain. Here, campers gather at night under African skies to share the day's stories. Everybody from a lone cyclist right up to the long-term holiday maker in motorhomes are found here, as well as the odd local visitor. The complex lies between two of the Clane Caledon's earlier tributaries, which entertains the visitor with sight and sound after good rainfalls. The park management offices overlook the Wilchenhof Environmental Education Centre, where large groups of either travellers, environmental study groups or school groups are accommodated. A secluded location, away from nearly all other human interaction, which challenges the typical perception of Africa as low, flat prairies covered with trees and bush, lies hidden up in the mountains. This is the Highlands Mountains Retreat, a spot so special it's only available to a small number of visitors each year. Here, a handful of remote log cabins is perched high up in the mountains and entertains the guests with its pristine terrain and absolute silence. The Drakensberg Range, one of Africa's most famous, is seen in the not too far distant horizon. The park is located in the Royberg mountain range, which itself forms part of the Drakensberg Maluti mountain system. Um, the geology of Golden Gate is, uh, is the type of geology that you don't actually see anywhere else. You, you can actually travel this country, but if you want to see the exact geology of Golden Gate, you have to come to Golden Gate. I mean, when you look at our, um, our landscape, the landscape that you have, you actually will notice that there are different layers that were deposited in different you know, geological uh, eras. The geological formations in the park are part of the Karoo Supergroup, a massive sequence of sedimentary and igneous rock layers that spreads right across South Africa. Looking at the scenery now, it's hard to imagine that this landscape was once covered by glaciers when Gondwana land was located way south on the planet. Much later, the central South African countryside was a green world adorned with streams, rivers and lakes and teeming with life. Yet, within a few million years, the same area would change into a warm, arid desert with magma-filled craters and fissures. To the modern-day visitor, a most intriguing aspect of the mighty rock formations is the clearly discernible colouring of the various layers. These layers, where quite a bit of Earth's history is literally cast in stone, have been classified into a number of formations mainly the Elliott Formation, the Clarence Formation, and the Drakensberg Formation. The Elliott Formation, a red mudstone which is rich in vertebrate fossil content, is of particular interest, especially to the dino hunters amongst us. Um, and so it's a series of rocks that go right across South Africa. They go into Lesotho, um, they go into Natal, they go up, and in fact, we have comparable rocks in Zimbabwe and Mozambique, too. So those, those rocks in the Elliott Formation, um, they haven't been dated yet, but they're about 200 million years old. Um, and so that puts them right at the earliest part of what we call the Jurassic period. Um, and so, you know, in a sense, we have our own Jurassic Park 
um, right here in South Africa. It was in this layer where in 1976, a most significant discovery was made, but more about that later. The Clarence Formation is characterized by the yellow-brown cliff faces and forms the predominant layer seen throughout the park. This layer varies between 110 meters to 195 meters thick. And on top of those rocks, there's the, the famous Clarence sandstone, right? This bluff, um, uh, white sort of uh, sandstone that forms these great cliffs and then occasional caves dipping into the cliffs. Now that is um, also dinosaur age. Um, it's a little younger than 200 million years old. Um, and what's happening is that if you think about the environment changing over time, there's a lot of water around when the dinosaur eggs were deposited, but it gets drier and the desert starts to creep in on the, on the dinosaur's back door, so to speak. And those bluff sandstone cliffs, those are sand dunes. And that's actually a sand dune starting to creep over and desertify the Clarence area. And those sand dunes sweat, stretch all the way from Namibia. Um, in fact, there, there are some in Namibia now doing the same thing. They stretch all the way from Namibia, all the way across Southern Africa. It got really bad here. Um, things got bad for life. And we find a lot fewer dinosaurs um, because it, it was arid. The Drakensberg Formation lies on top of the Clarence Formation and forms the mountain summits in the area. About 10 million years after those sand dunes came in, all of a sudden things get terrible. Um, so volcanic activity starts um, and you get these massive sheets of lava that are deposited on, the, on top of the dunes. And in some cases they run right through the dune fields. Um, and those sheets of lava end up being over a couple kilometers thick and they form what, what caps the whole thing. It's called the Drakensberg Lavas, and they form the, most of the Drakensberg today. One of the most impressive displays of basaltic cover in the park is Cathedral Cave. Here, a relatively narrow opening in the basalt layer 60 meters above is supported by the much eroded sandstone structure, which was weathered out by wind and water over millions of years. Quite noticeable throughout the park are strange vertical black lines running down rock faces. Those lavas leach, so as, as it rains, as the weathering takes place, minerals come out of the lavas and they stain the rocks below. So those, those tears that, you know, the, the sort of tears that you see on the Clarence sandstone, well, those are minerals that were deposited in lavas being carried down, being carried downstream, downhill um, by natural rain and weathering processes. One of the park's drives takes the traveler through all three rock formations. And you drive past this egg site on your right. You can take a loop called the Blessbuck Loop, and it goes uphill. And it leaves the Elliott Formation. It goes into the Clarins, these dunes that I talked about. And you wind your way through the dunes going uphill until you get to the top, which is where the lavas came out. Now those, those lavas are the ones that are jet black. It's really good soil. And so, you know, if you go up there on an afternoon, you'll see wildebeests up there. You'll see um, springbuck grazing. Often seen in the mountains are lines of a different kind of rock, which to the observer might seem somewhat out of place. These rock lines were formed when the earth started to heave due to immense pressure from volcanic activity below causing cracks in the hard sandstone surface layers above. These cracks were then filled by molten rock magma as it eventually broke through to the surface, which much later, as it cooled, turned back to solid rock. In 1902, an almighty drought came over the Highlands area, which, with the ravages of local warfare, meant disaster. For the first time in recorded history, the Caledon River ran dry. And then we were also in the depression years, and there were stories that were told of people who were very ill, and they were now in the drought. They were very ill, and they were very ill, and they were very ill, and and all that they had, it was pampoon on the dak. The people had to be in the 
En daar was onder een zeewekinder, die zijn allemaal was geel van die pompoen om. Dat is al wat hulle gehad het, is pompoen en thee. Nou, ek weet hoe ek nou maar groot word. En my pa en ma kom by die huis en sê maar, wat eet ons vanavond? En my ma gesê pompoen en thee. Nou, maar jy weet, eindelijk is daar niks nie. Through analysis of records, extreme fluctuation in rainfall is not new to the area. The last drought, recorded in 2015-16, was devastating to the countryside. Yeah, summer's not terribly hot. This is the hottest summer I've ever known. Moshe Malamabe recalls his Basutu elders' take on weather and the stars. So they, they, they sort of knew all those techniques. And they, you know what? They knew astronomy. And they were very conversant with astronomy. They could predict the weather. They could predict the weather by looking at the sky, merely looking at the skies and the stars. This star, if it is like this and going this way, we know we, we might have drought. Even when the storm will be experienced, they will tell you that. Look, after two, two weeks, we might experience a storm. So that, that cultural knowledge was very, was, very, was very rife in this place, and then they knew everything concerning their life and the values of life, in fact. It's a winter scene, and what you see on the river, it's called the frozen put. And what you see on the river is ice. So that's how cold it was when he sat there and actually froze himself <laughs> almost. It can be 10 centimeters, the ice can be 10 centimeters in thickness. I mean, you can walk upstream. Uh, it can be minus six, minus eight, it's seven in the morning, and by 11, you're sitting outside having tea, plus 18. So your days are very pleasant from nine to half past four. And as soon as the sun goes down, back into the house in front of the fireplace. It snows every year, always up on the mountain side which is what one looks forward to because it helps when it melts, it helps to feed the mountain and the, f the springs. Um, I suppose we get two or three snowfalls down here during the winter months, much to the delight of the guests. They love it. Mm. Except <laughs> you go into the kitchen and there could be 20 pairs of shoes all being they dry out. They don't come equipped with Wellingtons. Hmm. This jolly coat. Maar mooi. Die lucht is blau, blau, blau. Dit is heerlijk. Dit is vooral hier bij ons is het koud. Want die zon gaat vroeg onder half vier, moet hier zijn weg. Half negen komt die zon eerst op. Want ons in die bergen weerskante van ons. Maar dit werk goed van ons. Dan het ons een vroege aand by die huis en ons geniet het door. But the snow is a big thing in winter. People will phone and say, is it snowing yet? And you sort of go, um, no. Well, tell us when it snows. But it's a big attraction here. Fireplaces, um, you go into every restaurant, you get glue wine, red wine. It's, you know, everybody says, oh, how can you live? It's a lovely place to stay in winter. It's, it's cosy, and it's one of those really, you feel like you're in winter. Golden Gate Highlands National Park is a protected grassland reserve, the only park of its kind in South Africa and because it doesn't have the big five, hiking and camping are popular park attractions and the avid game viewer is richly rewarded. Zebra, 
Eilanti, Renale, Black Valde BSC, Renale, Spring Walker, Renale, Blast Walker, Renale, Ray Hunter BSC. En dan natuurlijk in Nikus die feit dat ons die zwart willen bezig in uh, Gullengai. Een noemenswaardige getallen. Ons praat zeker van plus minus 850 zwart willen bezig. Wat een geweldig cijfer is. Als ons denkt dat met die Anglo Boerenoorlog voor die zwart willen bezig op die rand van uitsterven, was het niet geweest voor een klompje boeren en Harry Smit, wat onmiddellijk opgetreden en hulle beginnen bewaren het niet. Lijpers was op het stadium helemaal uitgedaan hier. En de uitstelling telling, telling van vier jaar geleden heeft al zes lijpers hier opgeteld. Die elanden in die omgeving was nooit behoorlijk uitgeroeid. Het was verschrikkelijke skelm goed in die bergen. Hulle maakt ze bobbianen, hulle zit ook een wacht uit. Uh, uh, wat moet kijken als het gevaar voor hom lijk is aan die kom. En dan hier die bergen, daar was een geweldige groot trop en is nog in die omgeving van Sunny Pass. En die Sunny Pass elanden het zo so verschrikkelijk geworden dat delen daarvan een begint te afvallig raak van die ander en met die bergen hier kan te komen. Want die jaren was de je kon van Sunny Pass af een wilderness area basis komt op bij Gangai. Van die elanden het al langs die bergen gaan. Nou het hulle van die tussen die bergen opgeskuif om aan hierdie vlak te, te loop en wij maar aangrensend aan die bergen. Want Elande hier is niet zoals die Elande in Ekelari. Hier die Elande hou daarvan om op vlaktes te wees en dan gaat hulle in die bergen, hulle aard besonder goed in hierdie bergen. The Eland was also regarded by the early inhabitants of the area, the San people, as being created with supernatural potency by their creator deity, Agen. The Free State province, within which the park falls, was once teeming with glorious game. An earlier European hunter in the area described the hillsides as colored red by Springbok, and as far as the eye could see, a sea of moving red. The province gained fame as the hunter's paradise as far back as the 1860s, and sadly, it was also in this time that yet another drought hit the area. Die plaatsen was klein in die omgeving. Misschien partijboeren wat een beetje meer vooruitstrevend geraak het door een of ander vorm van boerderijactiviteit wat ons niet goed geken het nie. Het dan ander plaatsen gehad waar hulle in die, so in die winter hulle vee heen verskuif. Maar ik weet als kind dat dit was een moeilijke wereld. Dit was waar, waarachtig waar een moeilijke wereld. Combined with the aftermath of the Basutu Wars in 1866, Farmers increasingly started killing wildlife to conserve grazing for their domestic herds. This led to a situation where a market for game hides developed due to low-priced oversupply. Then demand went up and the senseless killing escalated to a point where preachers chastised hunters from the pulpit. One story goes that the vultures in the area were so well fed that they lazily walked between skin carcasses left to rot by the hunter only eating the softest outer tissue. As all die wild wat daar geskiet was dier die boere, boere wat een oorvloed was, wild wat geslag is, en dan die boere hulle plaatsen name uitgeskryf op wildsvelle wat langs die plaatsen hek gele. Met verskillende kleur, zebra stikke, zebra vel met die strepe, zwart wille beeste, al die type van. Dit was die Riemland. Nooit het iemand gedink dat sy ooit opraak. Dat is een woorden schietcompetitie geopen zaterdag. Dan kijk wie of groepen kon die meeste sprongbokken schiet op een zaterdag. Dan was het duizend bokken voor een groep van vier of vijf jachters. Niks naaks. Om wat meer te maken? Dat los om te vrot vrij als wel. Preservation of this wild natural resource has traditionally been top of mind for the Basutu people. Uh, they used to hunt here many. Uh, animals that were found here, conservative. They used to know that they should preserve the nature. The natural things were preserved. Even during the hunting, they could not just hunt at any time. But they were hunting some animals that were grown up. 
So it was very much controlled. Yeah. We could not just be punished there in the field, but now the matter will be brought to the chief now. Even during the cutting of this grass, the cutting of the trees was done in a very proper manner, uh, allowing nature to, to grow up. Distribution and migration of game in the park and neighboring areas are largely determined by the availability of natural grazing. The weiding is sier bolle. Hy is geweldig sier. En die vee vreet om net a sekere tyd, wat a kort tyd vir die seisoen is, vreet vee en wild om. Dan word hy te sier, dat hy maak dams dikstamme, en hy steek, hy is makkele monde sier, en hier die kant van die berge is hoedveld. Dan trek hy vee van die nood, en interessant wees soos die liewe voorsienigheid dit voorsien het, a sekere tyd van die jaar concentreer hy daar, want hy is gauw oor sig ander veld. Concentreer hy wel daar, en op een stadium afaseer hy uit. Die veld wat nou hier gaan aankom, is heel te maal vaarbaar vir vee, en trek al die wild hier deur. Nou as jy vandag terugreid Clarence toe hier vanaf, en let jy op aan jou linkerkant, as a baie diep sloot is, hier by die Titanic voorbij gaan, as a baie diep sloot. Die rede vir die diep sloot is wild, wat sy trekroute is, was, van achter die berge, want dit is mis nou persnek, na die hierdie soeter dele toe, hier dier die kloof. En net hiervoor split die slewe sloot in twee, baie duidelik. Van die trek wil soos die elande by die berge geblij, en kom hulle dier en vat hulle hier die route, en gaat hulle in die boogand van die dragingsberge verblij. Jou gewone vlakte wil jou blesmok en jou zebras, is met die rechte pad hier vanaf, reid sy kant toe. Nowadays, large herds of various game roam the plains and hillsides in the park. Although most of these animals are to be seen on the excellent day drive routes, an area less visited and casually referred to as Little Serengeti accommodates large numbers of animals, where human interference is minimal and herd movements are largely unrestricted. A visit to the area clearly illustrates why this is called Little Serengeti. Just on the other side of the mountain, you will find a park feature which at first glance could leave the visitor slightly puzzled. So we have also a program in the park which is absolutely fantastic and that's called the, the Vulture Feeding Program where we, we're looking after both the Cape Vultures and the very, very critically endangered bearded vultures. Very special birds, the Lamahaya very special beds that you find predominantly in this area. And how uh, the species have actually been shrinking in a number of years, where at the moment we, all, we have just over 300 of those birds left in the area. You know, so as a park, we run a program where we actually provide supplementary food for these vultures. So we have a, a beautiful place called, that we call uh, the, the, the vulture restaurant. And uh, you know the nice thing about this vulture restaurant is that you find people who say, okay, but what, what's, what kind of cuisine do they serve at a vulture restaurant? Because people believe, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a restaurant where people can go and have their meals. But, but the truth is, you know, when we're looking after these birds, you know, uh, we actually try and treat them to that as well, you know. So uh, normally as a park, you know, uh, the local farmers are very, are very generous. I mean, every time um, a cow or a horse or a donkey dies on a farm, they will normally get hold of us to say, guys, we know you are doing a great job. You, you, we know you're looking after these birds. Please, can you come and collect the carcass? And there's an organization called uh, the Ordinary Rangers. The Ordinary Rangers um, is one organization that works very closely with South African National Parks in terms of going out there and assisting sand parks uh, in, 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 in a way sometimes to, to also raise funds for conservation. And, and they, they donated a beautiful trailer uh, for Golden Gate that with, a, with a beautiful winch and, uh, and, and a soul for us to be able to cut these carcasses for the best to be able to eat. So we, we go out there and we collect these carcasses. But remember, uh, the rangers, they know very well, they are well trained. You know, when they go and collect the carcass, they know which questions to ask so that you don't collect the carcass that will now eventually kill all the birds. 
then you have other scavengers as well who will also uh, uh, take this opportunity and, and go and eat. And now, at the moment, we are, we are actually busy now with uh, a, a research in terms of uh, the competition um, between the, the, the vultures and the blackback jackal uh, in terms of the supplementary food that we provide. South Africa is known as a hotbed of fossils and has been a preferred fossil hunting site for centuries. Um, so, so fossil hunting actually has a, a really long history in this country. Um, and in fact, there were these fossil parties that used to go out and have a picnic um, in the Eastern Cape in the 1840s. And there's a famous one. They went to a place called um, Iguanodon Hook. So this party uh, combed the cliffs looking for fossils, and, and what they found was actually incredible. Um, they found the remains of something we call a, a stegosaur today. This is one of these things that has spikes on its tail, um, and it's one of the earliest ones that, that had ever been found. Um, remember, dinosaurs had been named as a group, like 15 years, less than 15 years before. Um, and so when stuff was found here in those days, the, the scientific infrastructure wasn't good enough. We didn't have an expert on dinosaurs. In fact, we, we have very few today. Um, and the material was sent back to London, to the British Museum, and a guy named um, Sir Richard Owen, who was the eminent, I mean, just the best anatomist of the era, um, probably of all time, he looked at that stuff and he said, these are dinosaurs. Sir Richard Owen described Massospondylus as early as 1854 from fossilized remains, making this the first dinosaur ever to be named. These remains were part of a discovery of 56 bones in 1853 near Harrismith, not far from the park. In 1976, a discovery was made that would put South Africa firmly on the international paleontology map. Well, well, Golden Gate today has this wonderful paved road that goes all the way through the park, and uh, it's got these great vistas and everything. But you know, in the in the mid '70s, in the early '70s, that that road was still dirt. Um, and in the process of cutting the road and, and tarring it, um, they uncovered some fossils at a place called Roy Dry, which is just up from the Glen Rhiannon guest camp. Um, and in one of Witz's most famous scientists, a guy named James Kitching, um, who was a fossil collector, sort of you know, on a world caliber. He went to Roy Dry and he prospected around there on, on these reports. Um, and what he found were clutches of eggs. And we thought they were dinosaurs, um, but we didn't quite have confirmation. And so he published a short paper saying, I think I have some reptile eggs from Golden Gate Highlands National Park. Um, and it was over a dozen years later, scientists from the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto um, and from the university there came out and said, indeed, these are dinosaur eggs, um, and there might be more inside. Um, and so we shipped the eggs off to Toronto, and one of the best preparators in the world painstakingly removed rock from the bones, and, and she found babies inside. So the animals that, dinosaurs, that hadn't hatched yet. Other fossils have also been found in the park. Well, I mean, if you, if you look at the greater eastern free state region, it's not just, it's not just Massospondylus, right? There's actually, I would say, about a dozen species of dinosaurs there. So there's things with long necks that ate plants. There's things that walk on two legs that eat plants. Um, there's carnivorous dinosaurs, like I've mentioned before. I mean, it's like the Kruger or something. I mean, if you were to go there 200 million years ago, you would see a massive amount of dinosaurs of lots of different species, many of them quite similar, right? I mean, think of all the antelope today, right? They, they look similar in that they all graze on the grass or browse on trees, um, but each one you can tell the species apart, and it would have been just like that. Um, and of course, you know, we as paleontologists, we see a tiny slice of all the life that lived in a given place at a given time. Um, so there's more to be found, I would say. The Massospondylus egg discovery proved to be a lot more significant than anyone could have thought. So after the eggs were prepared and, the, and they published a, a short paper saying, we think that these are the dinosaur Massospondylus and here's why, and here are the embryos themselves, 
they went back to that site, Roy Dry, and they found not just one other nest, but they found something like 20 nests, um, all stacked up in the rocks there. And I'll tell you a bit more about the rocks in a second, um, but it looks like that was a dinosaur nesting ground. Um, and so dinosaurs were returning year after year or season after season and laying eggs in that one spot. And maybe it was desirable um, because it was wetter, because it was protected, we just don't know. Um, but we do know they were going back repeatedly. At another site, just a few kilometers from Roydry, where the eggs were found, we're shown dinosaur footprints. So in, in some sandstone rocks on the backside of the, of the park, there are these, um, a series of dinosaur footprints. And they go on for something like two and a half, three meters, all along um, a little, little bald spot in a field. Now those, those prints are, are really important. They're quite small. There's, you know, most of them are smaller than your hand. Um, and those prints are from carnivorous dinosaurs, so meat-eating dinosaurs that are more closely related to today's birds. Um, and now, when you think about the eggs and massospondylus, those, those are plant-eating dinosaurs. They're a little further away from today's birds. And so we didn't just have one sort of group of dinosaurs. We actually had multiple groups of dinosaurs in the, in the park and in the whole eastern free state at the same time. And so what's interesting is we've been looking for years and years for fossils, body fossils, bones of those carnivorous dinosaurs. And occasionally we find a tooth, uh, maybe we find a, a bit of the jaw. We've never found a complete one, but the tracks tell us we, we know they're there. They're just being, you know, the coy or evasive or something. Um, so one of these days, I promise you, we will find a, a complete one. Um, and it'll tell us kind of what we already knew, that there were carnivorous dinosaurs of different sizes, maybe some juveniles, maybe some adults, maybe uh, several different species roaming around the park, probably preying on Massospondylus and its babies. A most exciting development in the park is the establishment of a facility dedicated to the education of the region's rich paleontological history and further study of the site, where the 200 million year old massospondylus eggs were discovered. The Dinosaur Interpretation Center is in the pipeline. Dinosaur Interpretation Center will be exactly at the spot where um, these dinosaur eggs were found. Uh, in the park next to the camping site at Roy Dry, we are going to have this amazing, amazing structure where, where the world will actually come in and understand and learn about the oldest dinosaur eggs actually ever found in the world and how beautiful this Mesospendellus is going to be. I can just see how our children are actually going to enjoy the conversations that they're going to have there with uh, some of the paleontologists, some of the uh, staff in the park when they take them through and, uh, and make them understand the storyline in terms of when dinosaurs were, were roaming this land uh, until extinction and when men actually came and men started roaming the land and men discovering that the dinosaurs were actually also roaming this land. Now the, the idea is to promote paleotourism in South Africa. We're not getting a great return from it and we have something to show people. So this, this interpretive center is, is a step in that direction. And there are other places around the country, the Kitching, um, interpret the Kitching Fossil Center um, in New Bethesda is one of them, and it's been very successful. Um, so the, the center, um, it's gonna look, there's gonna have a nice picture window looking right out at the Roy Dry site, um, right where those eggs were found. And we're hoping to, in, in several ways, to make it more of a living center than just a fixed thing. So we're gonna hopefully hire um, an interpretive, uh, a PhD student or a postdoctoral fellow who, who does the science, someone who knows what they're talking about, who's worked on dinosaurs, and they can help interpret the science for the common person, for, for the average taxpayer, if you will. We're also gonna hire some fossil preparators, so they'll be removing rocks from bones right on the site, um, and in that way contributing to the, um, building the collection um, and building our knowledge of these dinosaurs. We know there's more to be found. Um, I've been there and found some fossils at the site. So we know if you dig a bit deeper, we may find more nests, we may find the parents. Um, and every year we're hoping to go back for 14 days or so and just dig up some more of that site in a systematic way um, with the idea of uncovering a little bit more of the, the treasures that are still buried. Thank you.
Driving to one of these dinosaur excavation sites, we come across a stone-walled kraal, which somehow seems out of place, even when you consider the earlier farmsteads in the area. Neil van Skolkveik explains how Zulu war survivors resorted to cannibalism for survival, and of a woman who refused to eat to live longer. And this is what Shaka op a stadium gebruik het in hierdie spesifieke omgeving, op die type gevechtsmethode, in in die selle proces dan is die vrouwens en die dochters saam weggevoer na KwaZulu Natal toe om te gaan deelneem in die bou van 'n Zulu nasie, 'n groter Zulu nasie. Beeste is saamgevat, honde is saamgevat en in daai selle proses dan is die ou manne en die kinders wat kon gaan wegkryp het weggekryp, het hulle naderhand uit die klowe uitgekom waar hulle geskuil het om net te vind dat hulle families is weggevoer, hulle het nie kos om te eet nie. Al wat hulle na kon kyk op daai stadium om hulle aan die lewe te hou, was die lyke wat oorals rondgeleid van slagoffers van beide kante. Later van tyd hierdie oorloe het al meer volop geraak, en daai tyd in die geschiedenis staan bekend, in die tyd van die groot Tifakani. Ons kan het miskien in die Engelse woord daarvoor, dit sê Purification Wars. Franse sendling, 1829 sendling, wat hulle kon vestig het in Lesotho, die eerste blanke sendlinge van Lesotho, waar in die mense besonder baie uh, verras was dier die voorkomst van kannibalisme in die land. Hulle het gereken basis laat daar enige iets is tussen 7 en 10.000 mense wat lewe van menswees. Na by Gullengeit, as jy op die vriesparkpad die eentje uitrui, staan die paddastoelrots. En na by die paddastoelrots is dan een paar celle wat gebouwe was, of, of ons kan het miskien tronke noem, onder een oorhangkrans wat toe gebouw is, waar die mensvreters dan mense, of kannibale, mense gevang het om hulle in te sit, om hulle vet te maak, om uiteindelik geslacht te word. Dan sal die klassieke story van die een vrou wat bitter maar was. Sy het geweet wat gaan gebeur en sy het geweer om te eet. Sy het haar eie leiding maar net verleng. Daar was Slanghaal en uh, Malapu se krale. Die krale staat nou nog daar. One of the more captivating stories around cannibalism in the area is told of Mushwe Shwe, founder of the Basutu Nation. So it is, it's in fact, as it is, it's a true story. Even the father of Mushwe now king of Basut Mushwe he was eaten by cannibals. Yes. And then Mushwe said, they, 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 they went to him and said, hey. he was left behind when they were, uh, when they were migrating from Tawawisi to down there. And then he was left behind with a, a small group. Now the cannibals came and then they, they took them and they killed them. And then when they reached Mushwe said, well, those cannibals uh, from that place, they, if, uh, they've eaten your father. He said to them, look, go and capture those cannibals. Let, let, let them come and stay with us here, because they are the graves of, of my father. <laughs> The area was also inhabited by the earliest of mankind, with indications of peoples living here from as early as the Stone Age period. Later, black tribes would move in from the north, with European settlers not too long after that. The San people, descendants of early Stone Age ancestors, were migratory hunter-gatherers and thus did not leave a lot of evidence of their ways of life, except a treasure trove of rock art. In South Africa, over 35% of the country's rock art is found in the Greater Drakensberg area, which includes the Golden Gate Highlands National Park. The understanding and preservation of this art is important because of its heritage and archaeological values. Here in the park, another rock art preservation objective becomes obvious. The basic necessity to keep art pieces in the original location. 
Location is as important as the art itself, as we know that early man had a specific set of influences which determined the artist's choice of location for the artwork. It is assumed that the last sand people left the area in the late 1800s. The people who are the people who are living in the island are the people who are living in the island. The people who are living in the island are the people who are living in the island. The people who are living in the island are the people who are living in the island. The people who are living in the island are the people who are living in the island. And there again, the island pops up. The antelope that is most often found in rock art and most elaborately executed with special attention to detail and accuracy. It is said that when the Sun Shaman went into trance, he became an Irland, potent, wise, and omnipresent. Snakes often found in sand rock paintings are rarely depicted as realistic like this one in the park, which exhibits incredible levels of detail in its simplicity. In this drawing, the close interaction between the proportionally oversized snake and the human figure clearly indicates a supernatural context. At other rock art sites, more typical snake drawings could have large tusks, ears, or even antelope heads. Rock art all over the world is under constant threat for a number of reasons, a few of which are also found in the park. Here, the natural deterioration of sandstone containing rock art has been a matter of concern in the Golden Gate Highlands National Park, and although the rock art is not easily accessible to the public, concern over recent damage to a number of sites by ill-informed visitors is paramount. The bushman taken in Senate Semona, Kitty Limo Dilite, and in Trevor Sogo or a Ritumana or about Wawangat, Havana Tsiboyazon, or Namo Limo Tinki. So Reza with Pilias or about to both the Mans and Batsama and Mona, but what I will have in Tosin and Amonare. Basketball in Guided in Tofela, Dibushoqua, Kikaho Hana Juale. To the east of the park is the area Kwakwa, a descriptive name meaning whiter than white. It was thus named by the sand people because of the consistent annual snow on the mountain peaks. Kwakwa's capital, Putidachaba, in Susutu means meeting place of the tribes. 
It was earlier known as Witsi's Hook, a phonetic interpretation of Chief Wetsi, a Mukuluku chief who lived here from 1839 to 1856. Morena Wetsi's cave came after that was uh, uh, between um, the government <laughs> under, under President Brandt. Uh, because their aim was to take uh, the kings and own that land. And King uh, Chief Wetsi go to uh, that place with elder people, children, and, 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 and women. And as I said, that place for us is like a, a graveyard because uh, elders lost their lives there because when the soldiers uh, uh, fight with, with King Wetsi and when, when, when the rocks or the stone falls there, they fall on, on, on top of the, 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 the children and, 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 and people who were there. But uh, Chief Wetsi managed to run away to Lesotho. Uh, I think some of, some of them uh, think maybe they kill him there. King Mishweshwe of Lesotho is roundly recognized as Southern Africa's undisputed diplomatic genius of the 19th century. And on the in the park is Kwakwa, the heilige Kwakwa. And there is a van of the Besutus weer veilig by mekaar voel wat daar hergroepeer het. Baie van hulle het Lesotho ingevaar. En hulle is verwelkom dier Moshwesh, moet oop arms. Moshwesh, a diplomaat, nie a vechtsman nie, het die sukses daar ingesien van getalle van mense, wat die selle taal praat. En hy het hier die mense allemaal onder hom gehergroepeer. Dis hoe die Besotho nasie uiteindelik herreis uit, uit verskillende splintergroepe. Upon his death in 1870, he was buried at his once impregnable mountain fortress, Tabar Basiu. The Sutu people are known for their relaxed nature and wonderful interpersonal relationships. Van beide kanten van die ras is hier baie goeie verhouding. Ons sien geen geen probleme of gevare of Onrustigheid hier nie, die mense het allemaal werk. Soos wat jy ook gesê het, jy sien nie geen onrustigheid hier nie. Allemaal doen hulle ding en uh, ons is, is allemaal blij met werk te heen. Het so ons ook om bevoorig om in die prachtige Golden Gate area te bly. De, na die oorlog het die boere hier, uh, my, en my opa was een van hulle, wat as een jongman, uh, om het deel, in Lesotho vir die mens hulle lande gewerk het en dan het hy een deel van die oos gekry en dit was hy betaling. So hy het baie goeie samenwerkings oor eenkomst gehad wat, uh, wat die politici later toe natuurlijk verwijder het. En um, ek denk as hulle die mens in het geloos het, so die twee nasies eindelijk baie goed uh, iets op een toekomst saamgebouw het. Maar uh, ja, dit werk nie altyd in die praktijk so nie. many of the European settlers soon took on Sesotho as a second or third language. And today, still, many of their descendants have a beautiful command of the language. The post-conflict harmony between Basutus and Boers is well documented. Normally, the, the, the Basutu were hunting in this place. And the Boers, who were there, were not disturbing them or not stopping them to hunt there. They could hunt and then they knew that after hunting they will go back to Lesotho. And at times they also get some cattle from Lesotho and say, okay, man, give us about 10 cattle or so, I'm coming to, to till my land here. That was harmony. By keer het ons ons gereid tot by die Besotho grens, het ons oor nacht op plaas, Die hele span, 30, 40 maaikies, ek die enigste miskien wit bekend tussen hulle, of twee, as ons nog een maaikie langs pad opgeteel het, en die volgende dag in Lesotho. Dit was die jare voor paspoorte. Rondgereid van plek tot plek in Lesotho, na by die grens, 
En dan het ons baie keer, was ons genooi om bij die stad te iets te kom eet of te kom drink. Dan was die ou oumas, ook bekend as die ongoon, die grootmoeder. Hulle het dan vir ons van kof voorzien, en dan vanavond het ons ook gegaan na die stroeise toe, en ons genooi om daar bykie met die kinders te kom speel en te keir. Dan die ouwe ongoene daar tussen ons gaan sit, en traditionele stories vertel oor die verlede van Lesotho. Various tribal and territorial wars were waged here, most notably those of the Basutus fighting the European settlers, the Boers fighting the British to retain independence, and of course Zulu clans rampaging through the area in the early to mid-1800s during the Lifikani or Purification War. 1820, a little before 1820, five years, maybe 10 years, and later is hier vijf nationale stammen aan die opkom. In Centraal Zuid-Afrika, specifiek, gaan ek een vrijstaat uitzonder. Dan gaan ons praat oor Shaka Zulu onder Natal, wat geweldig invloed op hierdie omgeving gehad het. Shaka as jongman, wat nou omtrent sy piek bereik as jongman, waar hy homself toe begin uitzonder het, as een van die grootste krijgsmanne, wat die suide van Suid-Afrika ooit gesien het. En dan, gelijk Tadjag Madom, een vrou by name koning en man Tantisi, wat daar ook uitgesonder het op die stadium, wat die by mekaar maak van die Basutu stam, bekend as die Tlokwa, en gelijk Tadjag ook Moshwesh in Lesotho. En dan kan ons oor opgaan na Muselkaats. Op die stadium dan sy deel van Shaka, maar op een later tijd sy eie rol gespeel. Hierdie manne is min of meer allemaal rondom 1770, 1775 geboren, saam met die vrou in het luis. Verskil van so'n vijf jaar tussen mekaar. En kan ons begin by Shaka op die stadium, wat dit recht gekry het om die Zulu volk op te bouw uit verskye Zulu sprekende stamme maar verenig onder hom in die vorm van discipline en mense wat hy opgeleid het as een oorlogsmachien. Fantasties hoe hy dit recht gekry het om die Zulu nasie op te leid, byvoorbeeld die groot skuldvel wat die hele lijf toemaak, byvoorbeeld die gooi assegaai wat hy verklein het na een steek assegaai, met een lang lem, plus minus 18 duim lang, en om te reens so 4 na 5 duim breed en hy meer skade aan haar, met een gedisciplineerde weermag. En Shaka het op die stadium geweldig gebruik gemaakt en gesteen op sy oorlogsgeneraal Misselkats. Goed, nou kan ons terugkijk na koningin Mantantis, wat ook aan die park gegrens is, aan die herriesmitkant van die park, waar sy was met die hardloomvolgelinge, die Batloka mense, of ook gepraat ons miskien van die Roykat mense. Maar totaal onopgeleide mense as hy by krijgsvoering kom, oorlogvoering. En hulle was ook veeherders, hulle was die wereld vol. En hulle het natuurlijk ook onmiddellik die aandag van die Zulus getrek. En op een stadium het sy besluit, sy wil nader aan die Zulus kom, want sy het hulle gevechtsvermoe begin in bewonder. En sy het nie veel hond haar afgemaakt nie, want die Zulus het nie buitenstaanders opgeleid nie met die gevolg dat toe sy heeltemal op haar gemak was, is sy aangeval die in een paar impies van Shaka, wat van Natal af opgekom het, en hulle het haar verjaag, dwars dier die Kwakwa Nationale Park, waar haar ruïnes vandag net buiten kan die park staan, meer na die herriesmitse kant toe. Een van die grootste stadte van swart mense uit die verlede uit, wat gebouw was van klippe. Passing the spectacular Protea viewing point, we get a glimpse of a massive alluvial valley formed by sediments washed from the mountains. 
Towards the eastern end of this valley, we found this peaceful looking 19th century farmhouse. We discover that this was once the setting of quite a unique military event. The question is, did the Boers do it, or the Brits? The history that I was told about that house is that just before the Boers bent their ammunition, because they were under attack by the English, they knew the English were, 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 were right, were, were hot on their heels, and they were about to catch them. Um, what they did is uh, they bent the ammunition so that it cannot be used against them. And before fleeing, I think they had a very clever uh, 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 commander who decided that in order for this house to, to be preserved, uh, he put the, the picture of Queen Victoria in that house. And I'm told that when the, the, the English came in the, into the house, uh, the intention was to ban everything. But when they saw the picture of the Queen, they decided we are preserving this. But according to another legend, it was not the Boers, but the British Army that destroyed the ammunition after the Boers had surrendered. Regardless of the outcome, it seems the future of the building is ensured for the next generation. As the park, uh, we moved uh, on to declare that house as a, a national museum and uh, uh, there were plans uh, to actually turn that little house into a living African museum because I believe it's, it's, it's part of our rich history. In fact, uh, the, the local people were astonished. These white guys are fighting amongst each other. What's wrong with them? Not understanding that this is English, this is a poor, you see. They were always, they were always astonished. How come? Huh? We thought these are the same kind of people and we are the other kind of people. Wow. Why are, are they fighting like that? The one farm, uh, it was known as Noit Brabant, which now is part of the Net Golden Gate National Park. There's a big cave there where, I don't know where it was, the Boers, I think, were there. Um, they were able to put their horses on the lower ground level and the bulls were on the second level, which was, uh, they were well protected there. That was well used. Mm. I remember one, 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 one time I was working, talking with an old man there at Forest Bay. He said, I was actually uh, taking food uh, to that cave going to give the, the, the Boers, the, 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 the English people were fighting them. I said, now, what did they say? He said, no. They said, now, the English people are burning their fields. There's a long story about uh, the happenings during the Boer War, but maybe one should read in the books about it. I mean, sort of, um, it's a sad story, which all took place from this house, actually, but, uh, with some of the family members still living in the area, um, it's still very sensitive about what people think about it, especially when an English-speaking uh, person married into an Afrikaans-speaking family. They didn't wish to be take sides and to remain neutral. Well. That caused a problem. Yeah, my, my mom was in Vanivala Buddha 
um, toe die, um, die Anglobore oorlog uitgebreek het, het hulle gevlug. Maar hulle was nooit gevang nie. So hulle was nie in concentratiekampen nie. Die ou mense met die kinders wat, wat kon um, trek, het getrek van een plaas na een ander. En uh, sy het vertel van, um, baie keer het sy net vir, oor hoe bid die ouwe mense. En dan weet hulle nie, daar is nou moeilikheid. Want um, die ouwens het geskiet rare, rare. En um, dit was nie een lekker tyd daai nie. Maar dit is gelukkig voorbij. En uh, al probleem daar was, dat het, het die Afrikaners en Engelse renons in mekaar gegeen. Want dit was Afrikaans tegen Engels en Engels tegen Afrikaans. Maar uh, die heren het dit later uitversorteer, want uh, my geweet, mens kan nie so leef nie. En daar het vriendskap ontwikkel. En... Once, a oh, few years ago for our supper club, we had a, an evening there. And um, it was quite fun because we had the Burki and the Brit talking and pulling each other's legs and that, because they, they're both there, and we're the only f two families that are left, really. And um, the two of them could talk about their ancestors of then, at the time, you know. It was very difficult for the Mausleys because they were second generation Free State Burgers, but they were still British, and they married Afrikaans girls. The, the, the two brothers married two sisters. It was very difficult. I don't know what those those families, how they cope, because they weren't. They tried to remain neutral, but neither side would would let them. This idyllic little town was no more than a small, rural outpost, a farming community, and its beginnings could not have been more simple. Very much a village. 29 widows living in Clarence and one bachelor. And uh, they all had the property which they could buy was quite a big size piece of ground. They all had a cow or two which they would milk and that would keep them in butter and cream. There was a post office with the postmistress very much in charge. We all, she knew everything and we knew quite a bit about her being <laughs> behind the count. <laughs> There was the post office, the police station, and then there was a general dealer's store that sold anything from needle and cotton through to coffins. I looked at the creer, he had a fight with his neck, and then he was killed. And he was in Switzerland, and he was there, and he was there to it. En toe besluit hulle om hierdie Clarence, Clarence te noem uh, in gedagtenis aan hom wat in Clarence dood is daar. Another story goes that the owner of a farm called Clarence wanted the farm name immortalized and thus played the exile story to gain authority support of that name for the town. Anyway, the first guest arrived mid-November and it was a Miss Johnson from Harry Smith and it took her all day to get her by train to Bethlehem and then a taxi from Bethlehem to Sunnyside. And this is taxi rank in Bethlehem which consisted of two vehicles. Um, well, every now and again he would come out. There were many guests traveled by train especially those that were on their own. They arrived, you know, it was a dreadful journey. It took you about, oh, an hour and a quarter to get to Bethlehem. The road was shocking. I mean, if you saw storm clouds come up, you would just not go. In 
These days, it's a bit easier getting to the park and its neighboring Golden Valley. On approaching Clarence from Bethlehem, the road meanders through vast, open plain countryside and flat-top sandstone mountains. The end of the journey is signaled by a break in the Royberg mountain range just before you reach Clarence. Here you find a prominent rock, which the locals call Titanic Rock. The Titanic Rock is in 1912. Gister. The same year to the Titanic was sunk. It was a great ship. What they said is it was unsinkable. And it was sunk in. It was a little bit of a ship. And there were people who were in the Titanic. And they had to decide to do the Titanic. The most of it was. And we were in the car and we were in the car and we were in the bus and we were in the bed and we were in the bed. As we were in the car and we were in the whole day, we were in three days. We knew everything. You didn't know the address, you didn't know the street name, or if you asked your wife what was the street, then you asked for the soup. Want jy weet nie wat die straat bly en my weet waar hy bly. But it was a different sort of place then. Everybody belonged to the tennis club, everybody belonged to the supper club, the hiking club, the, ach, then there was the bowling club, and they started, ach, probably 40 years ago, they started a um, Wednesday afternoon friendship club, they called it. And then Robert's construction came through they built the tarred roads in the area. And then, of course, Eskom Power came because of the Golden Gate being built. And then after that was the Highlands Water Scheme. That's another very big project. And that put Clarence on the map. Stadig on the Clarence in a great tourist world. Ontstaan. Uh, Golden Gate was there. Mens had Clarence besoek, of uh, Golden Gate besoek, not Clarence. Nie. Maar het was niet moeilijk voor Clarence om te ontstaan, omdat hij zo schilderachtig mooi is. En uh, er was net een hotel hier in Maluti Lodge, dat was de enigste plek. En uh, dat was maar mensen voorbij gereden, Golden Gate toe en terug gereden hier. En toen begon daar een galerijkje en een galerijkje en een restaurantje. En wat het nou 26 jaar later is, is daar nou hoeveel galerijen en restauranten. Clarence today is a thriving tourist destination and known as the jewel of the free state. Admiration for the town is not new, as in early literature, a visitor refers to it as that dreamy town, Clarence. The truly unique thing about Clarence is that many descendants of its earliest inhabitants still ply their trade here. One of the oldest trading posts is fondly remembered. Er is een winkelje op Clarence vandaag, wat bekend staat als Clarence Exotic Blankets. In elke uitbaas is een hele salaris gesteek in nikkerbolsen. Dan koop ons so een hele half zak nikkerbols voor 10 shillings. En alle andere lekker naaien, en die worden dan in twee verdeeld, dat hij beide kanten van die perte afhang, dat hij ontbalanceert. En dan eet ons dat die kiste erger staan als een Bobbianse. The shop is owned and managed by the daughters of the original owner, Mr. De Yaga. Indeed, this is where you'll find sisters Minnie and Gertie. They've lived here all their lives, with Gertie still living in the very room she was born in more than 80 years ago. The blanket shop is just outside the main town area in the shadow of the Titanic, replete with a tie pole for beasts of burden. The area was also impacted by the Second World War when it played host to a number of unexpected visitors. It, uh, in the Tweede Wereldoorlog had my pa Italianse kruisgevangenis gehad wat hulle Suid-Afrika toegestuur het om hulle as kruisgevangenis aan te hulle so plaas uitgedeeld 
en my pa twee Italianers gehad wat klip gekap het en gebouwe gebouwe het, hulle was ambachtsmanne geweest. In an interesting twist of fate, Minnie de Metza met her future husband who came to the country during that time. Where is you? Gina, my man was an Italian. He had come as a prisoner to South Africa. And he had to be a quaker. He had to be a year and he had to be a year. And I was still at school when I had to be a kid. And he had to be a daughter to be a kid with long hair. And he had to be a kid with no longer to be a kid with a kid. And then we were married. The combination of Clarence in the West, Kwakwa in the East, and the park with complimenting guest and holiday farms in between makes for an irresistible attraction to tourists, especially foreign tourists who often come for more visits. Clarence and Gallungheit today compliment each other. At the time it was not just Gallungheit and Clarence was nothing. I think now is the whole environment is now more all in great. Park. Traditioneel denk je over wat van Amerika of kom Afrika of Afrika is net die bos. En hier krijg je die zandsteen op te met grasvlaktes en dat is eerste ding wat je opvalt. Dat ik denk Afrika lijkt alles tussen die lampoepu. Wat niet het geval is hier niet en ligt niet het bij om hier te wees en die bergen te zien. En het niet gedenkt dat als ik er woon bergen in Afrika. Clarence is al. A well-known destination, such as what Kaapstad is, is now all Clarence. He is so young, and I think the market is also in America. But I think there is a lot to come together and sit, how can you get more about the people? And I feel that there is a lot of freedom to come for the people. Clarence is also a part of the people. But I think, as I said, Golden Gate is also good for us, for our, 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 our young generations. The volcanoes are no more, but the continents are still drifting. Eastern Africa is steadily detaching itself from the mainland. Australia is moving north towards Asia, and India still drives into Europe with epic force. Golden Gate Highlands National Park is looking good. The animals are well cared for, with populations increasing. The people in the area are not only friendly, but colorful and content. Guns and cannons have fallen silent. Echoes of charging tribes no longer sound through the sandstone valleys and wide-bladed battle spears now hang on guest farm walls. Stories of cannibals, though true, are now more legend than legacy. The droughts, when they come, are still devastating. The rain still etches away at the sandstone formations with every drop that runs down a cliff face, just like it's been doing for millions of years. What dinosaur secrets lie dormant in these valleys? What more do they have to tell us? Thank you. 